Well, good morning. morning. So good to see everybody this morning. Beautiful Lord's Day. Always glad when we have these opportunities to come together and worship God. So good to have each one of you with us today. If you're visiting with us, we want to extend a special welcome to you and invite you to come back and worship with us here at Pyburn Street anytime that you may have the opportunity to do so. want to remind everyone that tonight is our monthly singing night. And it's been, of course, right at a year since we've had one of our singing nights. And we always enjoy those times of uh, coming together and various men in the congregation leading us in song. And we encourage you to come back tonight at 6 o'clock for our monthly singing night. This morning, if I were to ask you, do you know what the Great Commission is? How many of you would know? I'm sure many of you would be familiar with the term because we talk about the Great Commission quite often in our services here at Pyburn Street. But how many of you really know what the Great Commission is? Well, let's take it a step further. How many of you know where it's found in the Scriptures? How many of you know how it applies to the Christian life. In an October 2017 Barna Group study, they uncovered a rather strange but rather revealing statistic. They surveyed 100 churchgoers. 51% of those that were surveyed said that they had never heard of the Great Commission before. 37% well let me back up 37 of the 49% could pick the Great Commission out of a section of scriptures less than that 17% responded that they knew the Great Commission and could quote it less than 10% could turn to it in the scriptures and show you where to find it As sad as those statistics are, my experience has been that even among the 17% who claim to know the Great Commission really understand the Great Commission, really know what this passage of Scripture is referring to. And this morning I would like for us to take a look at the Great Commission As Brother Mike told you, and as I'm I'm sure you saw in the bulletin, I have entitled this lesson this morning, A Greatly Misunderstood Commission. Intended to be a play on words. But hopefully, at the end of our lesson this morning, we will all have a better understanding of this command from Christ, and we will better know how to apply it. To our Christian lives. But first, let's start off with the question what is the Great Commission? Well, when Jesus left heaven, he emptied himself of all of the glories of heaven and came to earth, took on the form of a man, and he came here with a purpose. We're told in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, before Jesus came, Before he went to the cross and shed his blood, those that lived under the age of the patriarchs and those who lived under the law of Moses did not have the ability to have their sins forgiven. They were able to offer sacrifices and things of that nature to appease God and to carry those sins over from year to year. But their sins could not be taken away. They were still binding upon them. But over time, When the proper age came, God's love for this world was such that He sent His only begotten Son with the understanding that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3 and verse 16. Well, consequently, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, when that precious blood flowed from His body and His physical life left Him, it became possible for us to have forgiveness. Forgiveness of sin was made available to all of mankind. 
Those who faithfully lived under the age of the patriarchs, that blood flowed back and cleansed their sins. Those who were faithful to the law of Moses, the blood did the same. And from that point forward, even up through today, all of those who would live a faithful Christian life, the blood of Christ, continues to cleanse our sins as we walk in the light, as we do His will. Well, following Jesus' death and resurrection, He spent 40 days with His disciples, teaching them things pertaining to the coming kingdom. Remember, these were the individuals who were going to be the initial leaders in that kingdom. They were the ones that were going to usher in the coming of the church. Well, as he neared the end of that 40-day period and as the time of his ascension back to heaven drew closer, he extended a challenge to these men. This challenge is what has come to be referred to as the Great Commission. Matthew records the most detailed account of this commission. Brother Kerry shared this with us just a few moments ago and appreciate so much him sharing that with us. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. If you would, turn back there and look at this passage with me once again. It says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when he saw them, or when they saw him, he, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So he starts out by establishing his right to enact spiritual commands. He starts out by showing that since he has all authority, the message that he was about to deliver to them was going to become a part of God's will for Christians. And as we will acknowledge later in the lesson, this was not a challenge just to these 11 men. This was not something that was expected only of this first generation of leaders in the church. But then he extends this commission. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. If we turn over to Mark's account, we find that his account of the Great Commission is a little more brief and to the point. In Mark chapter 16, we find these words in verses 14 through 16. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So like Matthew's account, Mark starts out recording how Jesus initially established his authority, revealed who he was and that he had the right to enact this command. He reestablishes his identity, his divinity, and his authority. But then comes the commission. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Luke's account is unique even more so. But it still contains the same message as we find in these other two accounts. In Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 49, we read, And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So once again, as we've seen in these other two accounts, he starts out establishing his authority. That this is something that they need to pay heed to, they need to follow, because this is truly the word of God. And then the commission. Thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things and behold I send the promise of my father upon you. But notice that he takes this a step further. He takes it a step further and he reveals to them when this commission was supposed to begin. Notice he does not tell them, you go out right now and you start doing this. He said there is a time when this is supposed to begin. 
But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And then a passage that we often don't connect with the Great Commission. We see in Acts chapter 1 and verse 18, just immediately prior. I said verse 18, I'm sorry. Uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Just immediately prior to Jesus' ascension into heaven. He tells the apostles, But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now most people, those who are familiar with the Great Commission, If I were to go up to you and say, what is the Great Commission all about? Most people would say it's about evangelism. Well, the fact of the matter is, the Great Commission is not about evangelism. At least not exclusively. And here is what I mean by that. Evangelism is a large part of the Great Commission. But whenever we break down the structure of Jesus' command, we find that there is so much more to it than simply evangelizing. When we properly understand the Great Commission, what we find is a fully formed mission statement for the church. Every congregation of the Lord's church, this should be our mission. This is what we should be seeking to fulfill. Go back with me to Matthew's account. And I want to break this down with you this morning. Matthew chapter 28 beginning in verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power or all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now notice what he says. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. So what is the command in this passage? The command is to make disciples of the nations. Now how do we fulfill that? By going, baptizing, and teaching. That's the three legs of the Great Commission stool. Going, baptizing, and teaching. Going and baptizing are the evangelistic element of the Great Commission. But notice that the commission doesn't stop there. Jesus says that part of the Great Commission is after you've gone and taught, after you've baptized them into Christ, He says, then you must teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. This action takes place after the elements of evangelism. There is more to the Great Commission than just getting people in the water. There is more to the Great Commission than just convincing somebody they need to come to church. There is much more to it. And some of you may disagree with the point that I'm about to make. But it is my personal opinion that this teaching, in a lot of ways, is more important than the evangelistic elements. And I'm going to tell you why that is. Because if we take this view, that the Great Commission is only talking about evangelism, then we're never going to have a proper understanding of what our duty is, of what our goal as a child of God should be. But whenever we practice the totality of the Great Commission, we see the true genius of God's plan. We see the true fulfillment of discipleship, what God wants us to be as His children. Because when we neglect to take the commission all the way, whenever we fail to move past the evangelistic portion and move into the edification portion of the Great Commission, then we are really stopping short of helping people reach their potential. And ultimately, what's going to happen 
is when we fail to teach new Christians the things that they need to know. A big word that we don't often hear much anymore, but I think it's one that we need to get back to talking about is the term indoctrinate. We need to indoctrinate them with the word of God. We convince them of the things that are found in the scriptures. We convince them that this is the word of God and that we don't need to stray from it. But if we don't teach them to observe all things, then we run the risk of them falling back into the world or even beginning to teach false doctrine and leading many people astray along with them. But when we take this evangelism only view of the Great Commission, it leads to differing purposes and differing priorities. If the Great Commission is nothing more than a command to be evangelistic, then it's just one of many things that we need to do. And that's usually how it's taken. Usually when we think about the Great Commission, we say, well, that's just about evangelism. And then we go to other places to find other information. Folks, everything to establish the mission of the church is found in this commission. Everything. Evangelism, edification, and benevolence. Because if we are benevolent and we truly love one another the way that we need to, then we are going to be helpful of others. But also, as we grow and we mature as children of God, we're going to develop our own unique abilities, our own unique talents. God has blessed each and every one of us in different ways with different abilities. There are things that you're able to do that I'm not able to do and vice versa. Each and every one of us have things that we can do and should be doing to help people grow to maturity. But if we don't reach that point ourselves, we're never going to develop those talents. We're never going to develop the desire to use what God has given to us. But also, if we take this evangelism only view of the Great Commission, then it's going to keep people, as I've already mentioned, from reaching their God-desired maturity. God doesn't want us to stay babes in Christ, folks. But it's a very sad commentary on the church today that nearly if not every congregation of the Lord's church that you find, there will be members in that congregation that have been Christians for many years but are still babes in Christ. Sadly, we see many congregations of the Lord's church today being led by people who are still babes in Christ. Why? Because they weren't Taught to observe all things. You know it's exciting when someone's baptized into Christ, isn't it? It's an emotional thing to witness. It stirs us up. It excites us. And so many times we think, you know, we we finally got this person baptized. It's so wonderful this person is a Christian. And we stop right there. That encouragement that we had been giving to them before, it stops. The teaching and the guiding, it stops. We can't do that. We have to go past evangelism. We have to help people grow to spiritual maturity. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, Paul gives us a very practical view of what it looks like to carry out this often forgotten third leg of the Great Commission, that of edification. He tells us that we are to go, that we are to baptize, we are to teach. But something that we have to keep in mind as well is in that last portion, we go, we baptize, and we teach. But in our teaching, we better also be teaching them how to go and baptize and teach. Because the generation that's here today is not always going to be here. The generation of soul winners that we see in the church today one day is going to be gone. 
A new generation is going to rise up. And what have we done to equip them? Have we indoctrinated them with the truth? Have we encouraged them and taught them how they need to be fulfilling this great commission? But go with me to the book of Ephesians. Paul says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of love in itself. What this is talking about are those who have grown to spiritual maturity, who are the leaders in the church, who are the teachers in the church, And folks, when I say the teachers in the church, I'm not just talking about the ones that stand in the Bible classroom. I'm talking about each and every one of us when we go out here into the world. No, we may not be opening our mouths and turning to the scriptures and proclaiming the word of God to people, but you better believe we're teaching with our life. There are people that we are teaching each and every day by what they see in us. The way we interact with others, the way we treat our family, the way we entreat our co the way we treat our co-workers, the words that come out of our mouth. We are teaching people every day. And what's the purpose for that teaching? Because we want to equip saints. What's Paul say there? He says that all of these different positions, some of these were exclusive to the first century, some still exist today. But he said the reason that there were all these positions fulfilling all these different things was for the edification of the body. We build one another up using the strengths that we have, using our abilities to edify not only individual members, but to edify the church as a whole as well. But whenever we separate evangelism from discipleship, Rarely do we see a new convert that's going to stick around. Rarely do we see a young Christian that is going to complete their spiritual maturity and get to the point where they're able to teach and encourage others. It's not unless someone recognizes the importance of the Great Commission. They go to that person and they teach them. They baptize them into Christ. But then they take that extra effort. They give that loving care. They teach them the truth. They lead them to an observance of God's will. And by doing so, they come to be mature children of God. But sadly, this doesn't always happen. And this is why the old adage so often rings true that 90% of the work in the church is done by 10%. So often, that's the case. But our last point for this morning is this. Taking this evangelism only view of the Great Commission is the best way to make sure that a revival stops at the present generation. You know, we like to talk about the good old days, don't we? You know, from the things that I've told you in the past, I love to study church history. I love to go back and read about great gospel meetings that took place in years gone by. I love hearing about the meetings that took place here at Pyburn Street many years ago where so many people were led to Christ. And we think about uh, what we commonly call those glory days. It doesn't have to end, folks. It doesn't have to end. And it shouldn't end. But when we do not grasp the entirety of the Great Commission, then evangelists are not going to be 
developing more evangelists. Teachers are not going to be developing more teachers. In fact, and I find this very sad, but also somewhat comical, in many of the books that are being published today that talk about evangelism tactics, so much of what they are calling us to are almost marketing schemes. They want to turn to these great motivational speakers of the past. So often we see uh, names like Zig Ziglar and Paul Harvey and people like that being used as examples of how to evangelize the church. And why? Because so often the conception is if we can get them in the door, we can get them baptized and we can keep them coming back, the numbers are going to stay on the board. That money's going to be there. We're going to be able to accomplish more things. The more people there are here, the more we have to brag about. Folks, that is not the attitude we need to have. Folks, I love seeing these numbers go up because that, what that means is that more and more people are being influenced with the truth. More and more people are, are taking their spiritual life seriously. But this is not what's important. What's inside is what's important. The spiritual life of each and every person is what is important. But a congregation that is seeking to fulfill the Great Commission, and I truly believe we are. I truly believe that this congregation is trying to fulfill God's will in every way. But a congregation who is seeking to fulfill the entire Great Commission. Folks, we are not developing customers for a business. What we are seeking for are children to bring into our family. We don't want you here to get something out of you. We want you here because we love and we care about your soul. We want to help you get to heaven. That's what the Great Commission is all about. Getting people to heaven. When we talk about the need to properly emphasize the Great Commission, yes, evangelism is a big part. It is the first part. Because without evangelism, you're not going to become a child of God. But we need to remember that it's only a part. It's not the whole. And rather than merely emphasizing a part, let us develop a greater appreciation for the totality of the Great Commission. Let us reorient ourselves around the Great Commission. Make that our mission in life. That we're going to go out and seek to save the lost. That we're going to teach and encourage our brothers and sisters. We're going to help people grow to spiritual maturity. And in doing so, we're going to help the church to mature as well. And just as Jesus handed off His mission to the disciples there just prior to His ascension to heaven, that mission to seek and save the lost has been handed down to each generation. We are the present generation of soul winners in the church. Are we fulfilling that mission? Are we doing what we can to go out into the world to preach the gospel to every creature? Are we teaching them that they need to be baptized into Christ to have their sins washed away? And then encouraging them to live a faithful Christian life. Each one of us have that charge. We have that duty to do what we can now remember, I mentioned earlier in the lesson that God has blessed each one of us in different ways. We all have different talents. We all have different abilities. We have different things that we can do to aid in that effort. But are we using what God has blessed us with? This morning, let us all pause as we come to the end of this lesson. Let us reflect upon our spiritual life. Are we living our life in the way that God has dictated that we live it? Are we submitting to His will, using His Word as our guide in this life? 
Or are we trying to direct our own steps? Well, in doing so, eventually we're going to find ourselves in trouble. We're going to find that we have moved away from God and we've gone back into the world. Because when we direct our own steps, it's only going to lead to disaster. But this morning, if you examine yourself and you come to that realization that your life is not what it needs to be, then I have good news for you today. It can be. You can make a change today and remove that sinfulness from your life. Have a renewed commitment today to your faith. Be restored this morning. Or if you've never obeyed the gospel, then we encourage you today to become a part of the family of God. You do that by placing your faith in Christ Jesus and repenting of your sins. And then we encourage you to come and confess that faith that you have in Christ and be baptized. Your sins will be washed away when you come into contact with the blood of Christ in the waters of baptism. And you can depart from this place today in a right relationship with God, living according to His will. This morning, if you examine yourself, and there is a need in your life that compels you to respond to the Lord's invitation, we encourage you to come at this time while we stand and sing.